Welcome to the third episode of Front Row and Center, a virtual series presented by Colorado Music Hall of Fame in celebration of our 10th anniversary. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Karen Radman and I'm the Executive Director of the Hall. Since 2011, Colorado Music Hall of Fame has inducted over 40 musicians, industry professionals, venues, and organizations that have made a mark on Colorado's music history. One of these legends is Caribou Ranch, the famed recording studio founded by our guest tonight, James William Gersio. Caribou Ranch was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2017. Our host tonight is Patty Calhoun, the founder and editor of Westward, Denver's free digital and print newspaper since 1977. I'm also honored to share that both Jim and Patty are board members of Colorado Music Hall of Fame. Tonight, we welcome your questions for this happy hour chat. Just type them into the chat box at any time and we will pose the questions at the end of the session. Now it's time for you to pour yourself a libation and welcome Patty Calhoun. Thanks so much, Karen. I am particularly honored to introduce James Garcio and to talk to him about his illustrious career because not only is he a musician, producer, filmmaker, rancher, and legend who collected 36 Grammy nominations, produced more than 45 top 10 albums, 20 number one Billboard hits, and won album of the year for Blood, Sweat, and Tears when he was, I believe, 25, but he also produced the favorite band of two of my sisters who have been singing Chicago songs to me all afternoon when I said I was going to be talking to Jim. So Jim, take us back because you are from Chicago. And I know uh, you caddied at the Park Ridge Golf Course. But more to the point, when you were a teenager, you started performing professionally. I know you were working with Dick Clark when you were 17. Take us back to those days. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Sure can. No, I played. Uh, Dick Clark was uh, was a big break for me. I was 17 or 18 and I had a chance. I, I went on a tour with a fellow by the name of Gene Pitney. If you ever heard, this is, I'm, I'm pretty old, you know. So anyway, Gene Pitney and... Uh, uh, Chad and Jeremy, Bobby Goldsboro. Anyway, they were they were kind of station wagon tours. And then I ended up getting in the bigger band when I was older. But every summer I, I had that opportunity. And yeah. that's that's how I met Chicago. That's how I met. I was kind of in the C band. Then I got to the B band and and I got uh, Terry Kath replaced me as a bass player in the in the B band when I went to the A band and 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 uh, the horn players we all went to DePaul University together so anyway so we um, I was just lucky to be able to do it and back up all these artists I could read music and write charts so they liked me on those tours a lot of the wow. people didn't have any charts you know it was it was a fast start but you want to know did you Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Patty, did you want to, did, uh, did, what are people asking you? What, uh, well, are let's you getting see. any chat? About? I can tell you right now that Amber O'Toole has had hi, said, hi, Jim, long time no see. So there are some other questions oh, that are coming up specifically <laughs> about um, Caribou Ranch, but I thought we'd take a few more questions and get us to Caribou Ranch. So you went to LA okay. in the 60s. What, what moved you to go there and why did you get out? Um, you mean California? Yeah. I had, a, I had a grandmother in Glendale, California and uh, um, off, off the Dick Clark tour, um, Chad and Jeremy, I became their accompanist and uh, they were on visas so they would leave and then they'd come back and um, well, actually that's where I, uh, <laughs> there was a guy named Frank Zappa um, and uh, I, I met Frank and we, uh, 
he was putting together the mothers of invention and and that was actually i had a pl i had to play wooly bully every night because <laughs> we had a bar gig <laughs> we had a bar gig in cucamonga california so the, the the I was playing with a number of different uh, acts at that in in LA. I was kind of trying to break into being a studio musician, and uh, and Chad and Jeremy was in town. I would I toured with them, but I sp spent a lot of time with Frank and the early mothers. It's interesting. There was four guitar players. Frank was numero uno. I had a big E3 Gibson and I did a lot of feedback, which was kind of adventurous. There was a kid named Henry Vestine that became Can Heat. And there was another fellow, uh, Elliot Ingberg, who ended up having one hit, Don't Bogart That Joint, Fraternity of Man. I'm just saying this is, everybody knew everybody. And uh, we kind of hung out on Sunset Strip I'm, in fact, I met Frank in a coffee shop there. But uh, we were living on peanut butter sandwiches and, and playing in bars, too. Well, I've been reading a lot. So what you asked me, the big change from the big thing for me in L.A. was I had a legitimate uh, kind of pop job. But I, uh, my experimental compositional life was kind of with Frank to bring Stravinsky to the radio okay so that's why I focused on the horn bands and Blood Sweat came out of that but Blood Sweat I had known Al Cooper but that's a, if you're asking where where the studio came from um, the Blood Sweat and Tears album became very successful even though when it was released it was not considered a success even though we, we won album of the year, what, 69, so. Um, and, and before you gotta, that. You got to hit me those questions because I'm reminiscing so many things. You, uh, it's fascinating. You could just go ahead and reminisce. I was reading up on your. Well, I had a band. I, the first, the first, I'll tell you what happened. I had a horn band um, when I was on tour with Dick Clark and Chad and Jeremy. I got a call from my cousin in Chicago that there was a neighborhood band that had had a modest hit in the Midwest, and and it was and it was um, the Buckinghams, and I went and met with them, and uh, I ended up two of the guys that were on the Dick Clark band with me had a couple tunes, uh, "Don't You Care" and "Hey Baby They're Playing on uh, Jim Halvey." who's still around and Gary Beesberg kind of wrote these. They also wrote a song called Kind of a Drag. But the Buckinghams were dropped by their label and an outtake was kind of a drag, but I kind of liked it. It hadn't been released. And I signed, I, they gave me, a, they gave me an opportunity. They gave me six hours of the studio. So you had to be pretty organized and know exactly what you're doing. So anyway, that was my first, hit really i had written songs for chad and jeremy but my first production was uh, don't you care by the buckinghams and it had horns and strings and uh so in, in frank's mind i had sold out but i came back and played with them. <laughs> you know but i had a contract with chad and jeremy to write songs i wrote a couple of their hits anyway but from that ex from that experience with the Buckinghams, um, there's a uh, Steve Katz. Well, Al Cooper heard the Buckinghams album and Al Cooper and I were friends and he says, I'm gonna put this band together called Blood, Sweat and Tears. And I'm gonna use horns. And I said, oh my God, I'm putting this band Chicago Transit Authority together. I can't help you Al. And he says, please, please. Because he, he, I went over to his apartment and Bobby Columbia was there, Steve Katz was there. And uh, anyway, boy, this is going back. This is bizarre. And I had just signed a production contract as an independent producer with Columbia Records. And I'll never forget Sid Bernstein came in, who managed the Rascals. And he was the manager for Blood, Sweat, and Tears. This is probably a, too much detail for you guys, but I remember it like yesterday. 
and I'll never forget. So Al's here. He's showing me the songs for Blood, Sweat, and Tears. He had done some arrangements. And uh, Sid Bernstein comes in. He says, you just signed with Columbia. This is going to Atlantic. You can't do it. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and like six months later, I'm working. I was putting Chicago together. And Atlantic didn't sign Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Columbia Records did, which I could have produced, but I was putting Chicago together. And a friend of mine, John Simon, was a staff producer. So he did the first BS&T album, which was called Child is Father to the Man. But they didn't have a singer. And it was, it was not a big hit. And, and, and uh, uh, Al left the group. So Bobby Columbia and Steve Katz, and Steve's brother was a lawyer at Columbia. Anyway, they tracked me down in LA. And I said, I'm, I've got a horn band I'm doing. We're writing the material, we're working on it. And it was a big decision. I had to go tell Chicago I was gonna do another horn band before them. And, uh, but that's how it happened. So what happened for me saying, that's it, I gotta build a studio was this record spinning wheel. Well, they erased my master at the beginning of the fade. I was in a union studio and in the union studio, you had one engineer that worked the board. You couldn't touch the knobs or EQ anything. And behind a wall, kind of like a, uh, an island in a kitchen were the machines because they made a lot of noise. And Blood, Sweat, and Tears, uh, we only had eight track. There wasn't 16 or 24 track. I only had eight tracks. And I'd have to wave, I'd have to signal to the second engineer to stop the tape or to punch in to record. And at the end there, at, at the end, he hit a button and he erased all the tracks. And and I, it, this was a very, there was other issues. It was, a, I got fined. The shop, they called the union steward. I touched the knob. They fined me $500. It was a lot of money to me at that time. So I said, someday I'm going to have to build a studio. So that's how we came to Colorado. Every weekend I flew to Montana, Wyoming. And I was looking because I, the, the IBEW did all the TV. They were the uh, cameramen for all the television networks. Columbia was owned by CBS. So I just, I had missed, I'd come back from Montana and it was just too rural, too far away. And I missed a flight. And I was with a friend of mine from T Dallas, Texas. And he said, you know, there's this ranch outside of, outside of Boulder. I'm sure it's all developed now because it was owned by Transamerica. And I said, wait a minute, let's rent a car. We drove up there and there was a big barbecue and a trick shooting guy going on. I ended up buying the ranch and figuring out I was uh, 60 miles out of the union contract. So that's how Caribou came to be. And you bought that in 1971? Did you guys hear me? Is it interesting to anybody? <laughs> it is interesting to everybody. So, They're all putting questions in. So we'll get to those. I bought later. it. It took a while. It took me a while to do it. So you started setting it up, I think, Should in Give 71. me questions, guys. Give me questions. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to keep doing a few questions 71 now, and then we'll go when, to them. Yeah, we quote, it took all summer. It had all kinds of title issues. There was a lot of, there was multiple owners. I had to go buy out um, an oil company. Kinnock Oil I had to go to Tulsa. Transamerica was ready to develop it and build thousands or hundreds of homes. And anyway, I ended up making the deal. But I, I know I didn't get there till October because it was cold and it was snowing and, and, I, and we remodeled the barn. We started. I mean, I had everybody, they say, you're crazy. What are you doing? I said, we're going to record here. But I, first, anyway, and the first that's recording how was I got Joe to, Walsh. that's how I picked Colorado. Yeah. And I know. Well, I, I'll tell you, we remodeled the hayloft and downstairs were the horse stalls. And I, I remodeled the hayloft, and but I didn't have a console. But Bill Simpson was a friend. He had a record company in Denver. Uh, Janet, you know the name of the company? 
Does anybody know the name? Anyway, there was a, a independent label, Michael Stanley, and Joe Walsh had a band called Barnstormer. And I was, I think I was working on a film and I, and we had no console. We were waiting and waiting for the board to be built. And Bill said, Jim, you gotta let me use the room. We had the micro, we had, the, the upstairs was finished, but if you had to go to the bathroom, they had to walk to the cookhouse or step outside a 10 below, which they will tell you all about. So anyway, Bill was the first record recorded there, Rocky Mountain Way. He brought in a little, a little console and uh, uh, you got to interview Kenny Passarelli. He'll tell you all the whole story. I and by the way, movie. Joe and Kenny, Joe and Kenny Passarelli and, uh, and the drummer Joe are in Joshua Tree recording a new Barnstorm album right now. Oh, that's great. I know I watched a video with Kenny today who said he thought maybe it was haunted that um, Caribou Ranch was haunted. I'm sure it was to Kenny. <laughs> well, I'm sure it was. Actually, there's a number of artists that have, have uh, seen things or felt things, but to me, it was a spiritual place and it was all, whatever it was, it was positive. I didn't have any negative vibe at all. So you pretty much knew the minute you saw it that it would be the right place if you could get it? Yeah. It was just an old guest ranch with a bunch of uh, cabins and we restored most of the cabins, but the studio got finished as a work in, I mean, as a work in progress, you know, I, uh, yeah, so 71, we closed on the real estate we spent 70, 72 building it. My father came out from and supervised the construction. I had a guy named Tom Hidley had designed all the studios in Hollywood and I had a lot of the sound stages. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a work of art really, but the vibe was, the vibe was what it was all about. Cause see the whole key to the studio, when I had to do the Buckinghams, you're on a union shift and you, you could work from two to five, seven to 10, and then you're on gold time after 10 o'clock. So that first record I made, they gave me three hours in the afternoon, dinner break, and, <clears throat> and three hours in the evening. And uh, that's how I made the first record and became, was able to be a producer. But So the studio was good for the artists because we had, by the way, when you were at the union studio, you had a setup. You, you couldn't block book at that time. You could, if you booked, booked a day, the night was or if you booked the night and and so there was a lot of activity and you had to reset the mics you know ray conniff or mitch miller came in it changed the whole dynamic of the, you had to move everything around so you lost a lot of time the purpose of the ranch was we're taking a break let's ride a horse come back after dinner don't lose you know if it's not working let's just take a break but we had all the EQ set, the mic. We didn't have to break anything down and reset. Am I making sense? It's what everybody does today. But at that time, in the uh, 60s, I couldn't do it. And I wasn't allowed to record in another studio once I was signed to Columbia. But no what such other list. questions do you have? Uh, well, I'm going to ask, a, talk about some of the people who recorded there. By 74, Elton John was there recording. Over the years, you had everyone from John Lennon to Amy Grant. And maybe I could have been hallucinating, but I could swear I saw a photo of Dean Martin there. But it was unbelievable. Oh, no, Dean, uh, okay. Um, Dean spent thanks. Dean, Jeannie, he was married to Jeannie. And uh, his, son, his son was in Dino, Desi, and Billy. And, uh, and Billy Henchy sister married Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys. But the, I had the connection with the Martins came back to with Chad and Jeremy. When they first came to the United States, they stayed at Dean's house. And, and, uh, and then they brought, they brought, then they brought me back to do TV shows and to do the tours and play with them. But so, and the, and the Martin family was very close to the Beach Boys to all the Wilsons. And uh, so that's how Dean came to be up there. 
Um, Dina was a great, Dina was a great kid. In fact, he called, or Jeannie called me, says, would you talk to Dino? He's at Top Gun School. He be, had become a pilot. And uh, could he bring his instructors? So the, 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 two, the two Navy instructors came with Dino and uh, came with Dean. I put them to work. We moved cattle around on horses. They had a great time. And we had Thanksgiving there. Well, I know we're going to so get to some there was a lot of there was a lot of people there was a lot of people like that. Almost everybody came up. A lot of people didn't record. Some people just came up to hang out because I'd feed everybody. I remember Lowell George, Little Feet. They would come up. They were coming up every two weeks and cleaning us out of house. And home. <laughs> but the doobies, a lot of guys came. Up. Everybody that was in town would come up. But uh, records, Earth, Wind and Fire made a number of albums. Uh, Chicago, a lot of albums. Beach Boys, a little bit. Um, God, I don't have the list in front of me. You'll, you guys should look that up. You're Westward. Oh, we you looked at look we that. looked at that list. We Amy Grant did a lot of albums. Mm -hmm. We had, we um, we're putting together the Caribou Collection, which will have a lot of the artists. that we go. All the record, all the songs on the Caribou Collection were done at the ranch or mixed at the ranch. I mean. Ross Stewart came up to do vocals. Um, Elton did three albums there. Um, well, no. my son's going to feed me all the okay. artists. John Lennon. Them. What did John Lennon do? Well, John Elton brought John up. John mm -hmm. was great. But you have to remember something. I'm. <laughs> I was. I had a little trepidation about meeting John because the Beatles had broken up, and I had just finished recording Paul on a record called Ram. And I was under contract to Columbia. So if you look at the record, it'll say, thank you, Jim. And I, Paul did most of the record. I only did a couple tracks on it, but I helped him sequence it. I think it's one of his best records, by the way, Ram. And Paul's great, but I, you know, Paul's great. But I, when I heard that Elton had invited John up, I was kind of nervous, you know, and uh, both both of them used the same description. I said, what happened, you know? And they said, well, John is the best. That he just said, Jim, we had a divorce. That's all. It was just a divorce. We love each other. We just had, a anyway. I'm having coffee. If I come over, I come over because nobody, get, I do, at 6 a.m. I'm over having coffee and John comes in. And this is a punchline here. I said, I had, this is why I had the trepidation. I go, and he introduced himself, he sits down. And uh, what you don't know is Blood, Sweat and Tears beat, for album of the year, beat Abbey Road. Oh. Okay. It really, it was real. And I said, I want to tell you something. I'll tell you the Blood, Sweat story, but you, it was, Abbey Road was a great record. And then we became friends and we talked, but anyway. And that, that's funny, isn't it? I show up from recording as ex partner. I'm worried about that, and he and then I went, "Oh shit, we beat we beat Abbey Road, one of the greatest albums ever made." You know. Anyway, so we talked about that, and he said, "How'd you get such a clean sound?" Because he had he had done a review of, and he said it was too antiseptic. He he had criticized Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and I said, "John, you're right. I had a, I I created with a basic track. I only had eight tracks, so I I." I had to overdub the horns. I didn't, I mean, I did a guide track, but I don't know if your audience is following me, but when you've only oh, got are. eight tracks, mm -hmm. okay? And, and, and I'm doing a stereo drum. I had no track for the bass. So I mixed it with the drums. There's nobody remixing my records. Are you following me? Are you guys, yes. you get that Patty? They, so everyone is got following. Two, two tracks and the base the base level is on each on left and right because i had no more tra i didn't have 16 tracks i didn't have 24 or 50 like they have today so anyway this is all came out of having the studio and being able to experiment okay we we started with the 16 track then we got a 24 then we synced 24 you know we had so many tracks and i kind of like the a track Blood, Sweat, and Tears in the first Chicago album were eight tracks. You had to make decisions, you know, and that was it. Hard to remix, Patty. You understand? You I follow do. me? 
Well, anyway, gonna... the other thing with this, yeah, the, the, there was a lot of unique things about the studio, but the sound and the drums and the bass, big deal. That was the focus of that room. I'm going to ask some of the questions because people are definitely following. One person wants you to settle a bet. Did Tom Petty ever visit or record at Caribou? Tom Petty. Tom, I, Tom came up. Tom did not record. We had a studio manager named John Carcello. And John went to work for Daryl Dragon before or right after the fire. We're still, we're friends. He's a good guy. John built Rumble Studio, which was Daryl, Captain and Tennille, okay? And I think he met Tom when he came by the ranch, but the Wilburys were done in that studio because he tried to copy. I mean, Daryl was a friend, by the way. Daryl Daryl played keyboards for the Beach Boys. We were good friends, and he was a good... He says, what do I do? I said, do this. You get to uh, use 87, 67. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time through John on how we got the sounds. But um, I was excited that uh, the Wilbur, Wilburys, I love that record with George and... Uh, um, who was, uh, who's in the Wilburys? Roy Orbison, it was great. I had met Roy on the road because his guitar player was Bobby Goldsboro, who I backed up on his first tour. Tom Petty and Stevie Give me some more questions, kids. Okay. Um, well, someone is asking the first band to record yeah. in the barn. Uh, I'm and sorry. Joe Did, Walsh. Well, the first band to record in the Joe barn Walsh, was yeah. Joe Walsh. Now, right? Stephen, I'll tell you, Stephen Stills was there. Stephen was right after or during this. Stephen was living there and would come by all the time. How's it going? You know, so Stephen Stills might have been the second group. Actually, the first group might have been be. I think Joe was the first, but the weather report, Joe Zawinol came up and it was a jazz group on Columbia and uh, uh, very nice people. But one of the early the earliest groups would have been um what's uh, what was steven stills group's name will do you remember S steve was doing a solo album and he is you know gold hills right down the road he named his publishing company gold hill and he used to live in rollinsville all these guys came by you know what i'm saying a lot of people sat in on other people's records you know it's an um, amazing one of our one of our listeners wants to know what was it about the studio that attracted people there both the quality and the setting and it's got to be the ambiance too well it was a creative environment uh, it wasn't until tommy died i gotta tell you this i knew something was happening because when i do a mix i would go out and and sit in a vehicle and, and and how do I say this? Do you know people used to have a plastic Jesus on the dashboard? Mm -hmm. That was kind of my, I'm a bass player. And I used to come back in and say, Jesus is dancing. It's got enough bass. Okay. So we had huge, we had a really warm analog bass sound, but we had a real brittle top end as well. And and I shared that with people. Also, you could sing almost certain singers could sing six to eight notes higher, which I didn't appreciate until I did a, a song, Wishing You Were Here. And I had record, I needed another high part in the harmony. And I took the tape and I flew to LA because Chicago's on its way to Japan. They're flying to the Orient or Australia first. And I said, I'll, it'll just take a few minutes. Peter couldn't hit the notes in LA at sea level. We had a, we flew back to the ranch. I put the harmony on. And then when Tommy Dowd, see Tommy Dowd came up and did vocals with Rod Stewart. I can't tell you the tracks. You're going to have to research it. But um, anyway, Tommy Dowd was in the Manhattan Project. By the way, Will, you're still in touch with his daughter, right? My, I'm talking to my son. You're still in touch, right? <laughs> Tommy Dowd did the whole analysis, and he came back and he said, he brought Rod Stewart up. Yeah, he brought Rod Stewart up to hit vocals he couldn't hit down there. 
but nice. I'm telling you, if we could get a good mix at 8,600 feet, Tom explained how gravity changed the speaker and, and changed the tones. And he had all, he was a scientist, really. He, I said, Tom, he's a great engineer. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Aretha mm -hmm. Franklin, uh, Atlantic Records. So Tom did a whole analysis and confirmed what I had been hearing that if you can if you can record at that elevation it's different when you bring it down to sea level and listen to it am i making any sense yeah absolutely what other questions <laughs> okay some other yeah, bands that have come all up our, you get me all the trade secrets well I'm sorry. we like those trade secrets a couple other readers are asking uh listeners are asking about badfinger buffalo springfield and manassas were they all there Manassas was Stevens group. He did a lot of work there. Badfinger did work there. You know, I wasn't there when I only met them a few times. Badfinger, who was their engineer? Really good producer. Badfinger, great guys. Uh, I just didn't spend a lot of time with them. What was the other group? Uh, Buffalo Springfield. Okay. <laughs> Buffalo, uh, Richie recorded there. Stephen recorded there, but here's a punchline for you, um, how this all connects. There wasn't a Buffalo Springfield. My connection with Buffalo Springfield was, I'm playing with Chad and Jeremy, we're doing theaters in the round. There's a great, a great agent named John Hartman, whose brother was Phil Hartman, died tragically. John Hartman was a dear friend of mine and was the agent for Chad and Jeremy. And we're playing, we're sold out. English, you know, we're sold out. Theater's in the round. There was a whole California tour. And uh, we didn't have an opening act. And Buffalo Springfield didn't have a record deal. Nobody knew him. But I went down with John. He says, you got to hear this band. So I had met those guys. You know, I knew Dewey. And uh, anyway, I knew, and Neil was in the band too. And I went down, they didn't have a deal. They hadn't made the record yet. I'm just telling you, I made them the opening act for Chad and Jeremy, this unknown Buffalo Street. <laughs> They'll tell you about it when you, you interview them. I just, you know, they were good. They didn't, they, they didn't record there. Okay. But John well, Hanlon is the engineer that does all the Neil Young stuff. And John Hanlon did my remix of the Dennis Wilson Pacific Ocean Blue Caribou album, which came out a few years ago. One so of our it's funny how you just meet people in the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, wants to talk about when Elton John brought Michael that. Jackson up after the bad tour? No, uh, Michael came by, no, my, Elton didn't bring Michael. Oh, okay. Well, how did Michael Jackson get there then? Pat Leonard. Do you know who that is? Nope. He wrote a lot of Madonna songs. He produced Madonna. Mm -hmm. He was a keyboard player from Chicago that had a group that had recorded. Then he became a writer producer. And Pat was a keyboard player on that tour. And actually, my sis, my younger sister was married to the one of the sound guys on that tour. On um, which tour was anyway. Okay. Um, and that's how we met Michael and Michael, Michael was um, 25 years old, because I remember he died at 50. So, and he had his own, Michael was great. I'm telling you, he was a Seventh Day Adventist. And he would go down and knock on houses, I think on Saturdays, and deliver scripture. But Michael was great. Because he had a bodyguards around him, he was he, he. I'll never forget. He walked out of the house. We had a gate guard so people can get in, drive in, you know. And I remember him saying, "Jim, can I go outside?" <laughs> I said, "Come on." We took him riding. He, he jumped on it. At that time, it was a three wheeler, not a four wheeler. Uh, Michael Michael did a lot of Thriller. Did a lot of the demos and writing. And he took them all with him. But um, I listen, I would have loved if he recorded with Elton there, but he was he came by himself, but he had um, listen, we built a dance floor. We had a we had a lay plywood so he could do that 
four hours a day and do his practice. Michael was a great experience. He took my hat. I gave, he wanted my cowboy hat. I gave it to him. It's on the cover of People magazine. If you ever see Michael, yeah, I took him right riding. He had a great time. He's a good kid. People, we also have a lot of questions. What other Terry, questions? Give me. Uh, about Terry Cap. If he lived near you in Glendale, about yeah. what it was like recording him singing. Um, we lived near each other in Chicago. In Chicago. He, he, when the group, when we ended up in California, um, Terry Kath is great. Terry Kath, incredible guitar player. And uh, that's when I stopped, really. Well, we don't want you to manage us, but you can produce. I said, uh, you know, I was kind of, I actually tried to do an intervention uh, ask me other questions because it's very Terry's very painful because uh, uh, I've had two interventions in my life and they both failed. One was Terry Kath. I said, if you guys don't help me and get straighten out this drug problem, he's going to be dead in six months. He was dead in three. And Dennis Wilson, that was the other. Those are my the two interventions I failed on. You better give me more questions. I've got one. Now you might may or may not want to answer this one. What was the wildest group you ever had at the ranch? Oh, let me think about that. Oh, um, I wouldn't say the wildest. Oh, what was his name? Um, a great guy, Peter Wolf. You remember Peter Wolf? Jay, what was the name? Jay, is that Jay Giles? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You got to help me out, or I don't have. I'm not looking at my phone. Um, they weren't wild. They just, <laughs> they just, they just said, "Hey, man, we're from the city." They, 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 they enjoyed it, but they, it, it bothered them being so isolated. Mm -hmm. um, even Billy Joel said that. But you know what? Uh, the wildest group. Who was the wildest group? I wonder if it's uh, Ronnie Dio. War was great. Earth, Wind, and Fire was great. No, I know. You mean while misbehaving? I'm just reading the question. But how about this? Oh, do you have some more questions. Do you well, have any Dan Fogelberg stories? Well, Danny was a neighbor. Danny lived in Netherlands and did uh, did two or three albums there. And Kenny was a bass player, and my brother was the engineer. My younger brother Jeff uh, Fogelberg was great because. <laughs> You got to remember, dude, there was only one bar in Netherlands called the Pioneer Inn. And in fact, you mentioned Terry. You'd go into that bar and Terry would jam with anybody. I mean, there'd be a local band and Dan Fogelberg would do would just get up and play. And Billy, actually, I had a, a did it, Billy played in Netherlands, but he wanted to try out uh, turnstiles in Boulder. And we had a rent. We rented a, a club in Boulder. I, I can can I I can say this right you can say anything so, you want okay so Bill Billy's great he says hey we're we're booking the blue note and they got a big marquee but I don't want to put my name on it and I said we'll make up some name and just play one now he wanted to try the songs out and and I go down to hear him by the way he didn't tell anybody but by the time he walks in and sets up the place is packed, you know what I mean? The bartender wait. Oh my God. Anyway, he on the marquee it said Fuck moi. <laughs> that was the name of his group. <laughs> anyway, uh stuff like that would happen, you know, people play. I'm also supposed to ask you about Barry Faye taking you and Elton John to Fort Collins for the Rolling Stones concert in 1975. Oh, I remember that. I remember that one. <laughs> um, yeah, they picked us up, and how do I how do I say this? Yes, we we flew to see the Stones in Fort Collins. I had I had uh, I had my little baby with me, and I mean, it was we drove. I didn't want to. I might have flown one way, but I it made me. It was a big helicopter, huge like a Chinook, you know. Um, Elton got on stage and he wouldn't get off. <laughs> and 
and I get, I get, I knew it was a little tense. I don't, I mean, Bellin's got to write about this or Mick. I mean, I know, you know, I know those guys, I knew those guys, but I get back to the ranch and all the Warner Brothers guys are there. All the Stones record companies there, but they didn't show up. And El Elton was locked in his, I don't know, you know, so, something happened. I'm sure they're friends today and everything. But uh, Barry was a was the promoter for Colorado. Barry Barry was a good. He did the best shows, by the way. When I went when I went back to playing with the Beach Boys, we we sold out the uh, Mile High. And I think the opening acts were uh, Eagles and uh, Steely Dan. Because I I use I I use the Eagles and Steely Dan open for the Beach Boys Stadium tour. And when I was, so that had to be 73, 74, something like that. A couple Give me more another facts. question. Terry, Terry was, by the way, Terry's the only guy that we gave a house to and lived on the ranch and was into the ranch and was doing his, starting to do a solo album. Because I give him the studio because he wanted to play with different players. Not that there was tension. He just wanted to go a different direction. Uh, so any... yeah, Terry's the only guy that lived on the ranch. Oh no, Carl Wilson lived on the ranch mm -hmm. too. Uh, people uh, want to know: Did you two ever come to Caribou? Oh yeah. After they did. You two, but Barry brought you two up after, and they and they uh, overdubbed and uh, they made a film in Red um, Rocks. Uh, Red Rocks. Mm -hmm. So when they were playing Red Rocks and were filming it early in their career. They stayed at the ranch. They're great guys. Good Irish. Uh, any stories about America when they were there? Yeah, um, I don't know stories. There. George Martin. They were there with George Martin, and Jeff Emmerich was the engineer. No, Jerry Beckley might have been up a number of times. He was really close with um, Carl and Bobby Lamb, Robert Lamb. In fact, I think they made a record together when Robert made a solo album. I'm well, still in touch with Jerry. Jerry's a good guy. Oh, I, I got a story for you. We'll take it. <laughs> Boy, I'm, uh, I'm not saving any of this for my book. I'm supposed to be doing a book here. We had a kind of attractive cook. And it was like three feet of snow. When America was there, America was there. And, you know, after a week or two, it, you know, we had snowmobiles, but it was cold. You had park, you know. I come in, I come into the mess hall, and I, I don't want to say which guy because I don't honestly remember if it was Dewey or I don't know. But I know it was America. But we I come down to the mess hall, there's no cook. And there's a three by five card over the stove, and it said gone to Hawaii <laughs> so, so he they took the, the cook and one of the guys took off and we you know they came back in a in, you know a week or something but they went to is that the kind of stories you want to hear that is absolutely the kind of stories people <laughs> want to hear and they want you to write a book I'm going to take a brief commercial break to remind everyone this is the 10th anniversary year of the Colorado Music Hall of Fame Jim, you and Caribou Ranch were inducted in 2017. And if you all want to hear a lot more stories from Jim, there are unique um, experiences being auctioned off as a fundraiser for the Colorado Music Hall of Fame, including a fabulous oh, we're dinner gonna do a, with you. We're going to do it a ranch dinner, farm to table. You're doing somewhere. a ranch dinner. So those will be for I'll be the, I'll be out of stories, Patty. I don't think so. I think we have no problem finding more stories. Karen can talk a little more about that, but the site will be going live soon. People can bid on those experiences at the end of June, and Jim will have plenty more stories. Um, one question that's come in is, what was the greatest lesson you learned in your career? Or do you want to save that for the book? Well, there's been many. I wouldn't, I think, I don't know. You got to let me think about that. I had a great, listen, I'm the luckiest guy alive, you know? And uh, met a lot of great people. Um, 
<laughs> you were asking about the wildest group and I couldn't, I didn't identify anybody because there's been a lot of, a lot of groups there, you know. Well, you can, well, you can put them in the book. When is your book coming out? Do you actually, are you in the process of writing it? I'm just collecting some of the information. Uh, today is Pete Townsend's birthday. Any um, who stories? Um, I like, I met Pete a number of times, but um, uh, Roger came up to the ranch. Roger's the reason we had such ginormous trout. Roger came up when the who were, you know, I, I, I don't think Pete, Pete didn't come, but I knew Pete from uh, being on stage with him or meeting him socially or something. I knew Pete a bit. But uh, Roger Daltrey, a good guy, and uh, and he enjoyed. He came up a couple times, you know, and he said, "Jim, you've got to feed the trout." And we went out and we bought and we would throw the a, a scoop of this on the pond. Would go crazy. And I and ever since Roger told me we had to feed the trout, we were we'd feed the trout, and they got to be like <laughs> they got to be monsters. So that's because of Roger. He says, no, I have a place in Scotland, mate. You have to feed the trip. You have to feed the fish. They're not, it takes too long for them to get this big. Because we had a lot of brookies, you know, about a foot, 12, 15 inches, something like that. Uh, I, have to ask I like one. the who. Uh, one more thing. The best guy, the guy I spent the most that I was friendly with and liked, and it was a great guy, was Keith Moon. He died very young, you know, but he was, a, he was really a funny guy, very warm guy, you know. That's the only thing I can tell you about. The bass player is a nice guy, too. I think he passed away young. Yeah, here I am. I better write this down. Right? You have to. And here is the question that has come up twice, which is, is it true that Stevie Wonder drove a car at Caribou Ranch? No, he drove my Jeep. He drove, I, I had a military Jeep. I had a funky little military Jeep that's in Montana, actually. And I, I put it in super low, four wheel drive low. And uh, well, Stevie was down in Running Bear and you had, a, you had a lake, you had a road. The road was a dam for one of the ponds and you'd have to drive around to get to the cookhouse. You could walk and everything. And I just pulled up there one day and and I said, Steve, I'll give you a ride. Because, you know, someone's leading him, you know what I mean? And uh, he, I said, you can drive. He actually drove my Jeep. I said, you can, hey, you want to drive? And I got out and I put him in it and I put it in the lowest gear to go about half a mile, you know what I mean? And I only had to touch the steering wheel a little bit. And he said, and then I did it. I had to do it every day. I had to do it every day. He, that was his big highlight of the day, the drive up to the, oh, this is great. So it, it is, if somebody told you, it's, it did happen, but it was a Jeep, not a car. Oh. So the ranch, Caribou Ranch, there was the fire in 85. And after that, pretty much this, it was done there. How, what did you decide to keep when you auctioned off some of the Caribou Ranch contents? What do you still have for memorabilia? I see you have a gold record behind you. Oh, you'd have to. A lot of the, Well, there's. <clears throat> I had sets of gold records because they spelled my name wrong or something. And they'd have to send me a news. So you got to talk to my son. You know, we had a lot of furniture and we still have a little, quite a bit oh, of stuff. Yes. We had a lot of antiques. But uh, the big discussion in 85, and I still think about it today, and now it's probably coming back. I was not happy with digital. It was, it was too brittle. It didn't have the warm, if you listen to Drake records, that's the bass I liked, okay? So anyway, there was a big transition going now today, I think anybody kill for analog studio because it's got more punch, you know. But anyway, at that time, that was an issue. Plus, my kids were going were going to school. I was enjoying raising my kids, and 
that kind of thing. So. So and now now you're on a ranch, but not the Caribou Ranch, the new Caribou Ranch in Longmont. Well, we have a we have a little place in Boulder that was kind of the hay ranch. It was we had an upper ranch for the summer and a lower ranch. The studio was at the summer ranch, and we live on the uh, in Boulder on the, it's raises hay, horses, that kind of thing. Uh, but we I have a big ranch in Montana, southeast Montana. And I enjoy doing that. And we're trying to raise grass fed beef, natural, no hormones, no antibiotics. And uh, it's a good thing. Well, and let me make it clear the Hall of Fame dinner, if you buy it, is in the Boulder, the Longmont Ranch, not up in Montana. Well, yeah, Caribou Springs. Mm -hmm. We call it Caribou Springs because it has a hot spring on it. Um, had someone, a house just, on it. someone just asked, you mentioned the Caribou Collection, and I know on your website there's a reference. Is there a music collection? Are you going to be releasing that? I'm working. I actually, uh, I, I think I've got about five or six discs done this week. See, I've got to listen to them, sequence them, and kind of EQ them a little bit and level them out. But I, I, this week we were working on, actually, uh, Chick Corea did a couple albums. It's kind of a jazz. There's a lot more jazz. Uh, Tony Williams. Um, who was the bass player we had to order the big bed for? He's seven feet tall. Stanley Clark. <laughs> we had to buy a bed for Stanley. <laughs> He's seven feet tall. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm picking tracks that were done at the ranch. Uh, Tony Williams, Al Miola, Chick Corea. I'm kind of going through this jazz period, but then George Martin did David Cassidy. There's a couple of good tracks there. But Tony Orlando, Tile Yellow Ribbon did a couple of tracks people have never heard. Neil Sedaka came up when Elton was there. Neil and Elton produced them. We're just, I'm, I'm putting tracks together that you haven't heard. Jerry Lee. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah, Jerry did a couple albums on the ranch. These are all lost stuff that I'm finding and putting together. I just found uh, the two Jerry Lee Lewis, Carib the Lost Caribou albums in Germany. He had a co his cousin's Jimmy Swagger. He came up to the ranch and he was when I, I knew Jerry earlier, you know, but he was he was really in good. He was good. He wasn't drinking at all. And uh, he did a Christian album and the label turned it down. He did a, all these wonderful gospel tunes. I just found it in Germany, so I hope we can put it in. I haven't li none of this is licensed, but if it be it'll become available if we tell the story someday. I'm just putting all the history of the studio together, you know. So we got about five discs done, and we're going to do about another five, maybe more, because there's a lot of artists I forgot. Yeah. Well, someone is asking about Moondog. People have many more questions. We're going to have to throw it back to Karen. And Moondog, I'm glad you asked me. I'm glad you asked me about Moondog. What, are they, what would they like to know? I'm very proud of that. In 1969, Just I, record, I did two connection. albums. Mm -hmm. Your connection with Moondog? No, I, well, he, he, he was a beggar, and he stood on the street in front of the Black Rock, the CBS headquarters. And I would always, you know, I I always would put money in, if not but for the gods, what well, you know. So and and he and he, he could recognize your voice. Anyway, he's he said, you know, I recorded with Charlie Bird. I made records in the 50s and I got to visit with him. And I said, well would you like to make some new records what have you written and he said i have symphonies but they were all in braille <laughs> he he pulls out the i met him every and i and actually they thought i was crazy it was number it was the number one classical record by the way what to know because they thought i was nuts i had the biggest chicago was a bit, i i mean i had just done blood sweat and tears but i was so mad at at Clive Davis. I was so <laughs> mad at Clive Davis. <laughs> and I remember standing in his office and says, well, what's your next artist? You owe me two more hours. And I said, it's right down there in the corner. 
and I hadn't heard Mundo, I hadn't heard Lewis Harden was his name. I'd heard some of his stuff, but I hadn't heard what I was going to transcribe. But I was so upset. I said, I have my next artist, you know, and I did it like in uh, 10 days. But the most money was transcribed. I had to get two, I had to take all the Braille and write it on a chart. Those are good albums, by the way. I made the second one was rounds that I made with. He had a daughter. We found a daughter, and you should. It's recorders and little drums. Anyway, yeah. Ask me about Moondog because it's a big. It's a, a one of my favorite experiences. To, well, when it went to number one, those guys they hated me. They said he's recording a beggar, the street beggar, in front of the building. I think it's I'm going be on a little bit. So no, sorry. Well, we are going to. They're calling me for dinner. So, but anyway, go. Ahead. Okay. Well, first of Karen, all, I'm sorry, Karen. story is great. People are all thanking you for doing this. They are all urging you to get that collection out to write your book. And there's one very personal thank you for writing "Tell Me," which um, just because of how moving that oh, song is. To, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I wrote that for the, well, I wrote the music for the film, Electric Light. But uh, Terry Kath sang that song. Yeah, great. And actually, in the session, I'm playing the piano and Terry's playing the, my bass on the original <clears throat> on that record. Now that tune was made, that, that, that was a, a Terry solo performance terry's is, terry is the best guy i'm telling you karen are you coming in here now to um give us our commercial message about the color music <laughs> hall of fame sure enough hey jim and patty thank you so much for that entertaining interview it was awesome and thank you all for joining us and for your questions we had lots of questions as mentioned during the chat, the Hall of Fame is celebrating its 10th anniversary with an online auction, June 21st to 27th. The auction features 10 unique music, sorry, 10 unique music and cultural experiences that you and your friends can enjoy together, like the barbecue dinner with Jim. If you're not already signed up for our e-newsletter, go to cmhof.org so that you can keep so that we can keep you updated on the auction and send reminders when the bidding begins next month. Also save the date of June 23rd at 5.30 Mountain Time for our next episode of Front Row and Center with guest Chuck Morris, the legendary concert promoter and 2018 inductee of the Hall of Fame. Thank you guys so much and have a great night. Hey, ladies, can you, will you save all the questions so I can be prepared? We will. Absolutely. We'll send them all. Yes. I'm just saying, because they're thank probably going to come up at the barbecue and it'd be good because there's not a lot of interviews of me. I, I'm just doing it for you guys. Well, we appreciate you know? that. Really, really fun. I'm going to be singing your, these songs all night. The All the all 11 Chicago albums. Well, I, you know what, Patty? Listen to Moondog, will you? I, I will. just, I just, Sony just sent me a request for the new Volvo. I mean, I recorded this thing uh, 60 years ago or 50 some years ago. You know what I mean? And uh, so it's, a, it's, I'm real flattered about it because his estate owns the publishing and, uh, and we just, I just produced the record for Lewis. Lewis, Lewis went to Germany. He had a rich benefactor and he passed away in Germany 20 years ago, maybe. I don't, I'm trying to remember. I'm not sure. All right. We will all I listen to Moondog. Tr they're trying to do a movie. Yeah. We'll all listen. We'll no, save thank these you very questions. Much. Thank you so much, Jim. It was fascinating. No, no, save the, save the questions. I, I probably gave you too much info, but... I enjoyed talking to you. Thanks. See you soon.